Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Uh, good morning. Dr. Uh, Murphy is the- a nice wet day here in Chicago and cold. It's awful. Oh yeah, rainy and gray. But our returning viewers will remember Dr. Murphy as the executive director of the Havey Institute for Global Health, as well as the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg, Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week here on the Havey Institute for Global Health Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines and U.S. COVID statistics through today, December 1st. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with today's U.S. COVID statistics, average new hospitalizations per day in the last week were 2,588. Compared to 2022, in the same week, we saw 4,843 hospitalizations per day. Average new COVID deaths per day are 72, and in 2022, the same week, we saw 370. The new 2023 vaccine uptake for adults was not updated over the Thanksgiving holiday, but the latest numbers show that about 15.7% of U.S. adults have received that new COVID vaccine. Dr. Murphy, your reactions to those numbers? Well, uh, we're certainly doing better than uh, um, 2022, which was better than 2021. So we're going in the right direction, but obviously this is not going away. And the numbers have been even lower than this before. And we ex now is the respiratory disease peaks are expected in December, January, and February. So we expect these numbers to increase a little bit. Um, and um, they should go up starting now. And this is for all the big pathogens. So we're talking about COVID should be going up, RSV going up, and um, influenza or the flu should be going up. Now, um, the vaccination uptake um, is pretty low. Um, for uh, the new COVID vaccine, it's only 15.7%. There should be new numbers being released later today. Hopefully that's gone up a little bit more. But this vaccine is geared for the virus that's circulating right now. So it's it's a very good vaccine for what's going on. And you have a choice. You have the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Novavax now. Uh, for flu, which you know, so many people have gotten flu vaccines before, um, it's only 37.5%. Now remember, both COVID um, and flu vaccines are recommended for everybody six months and older. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to stop these infections in kids and adults, so this is a good way to knock out a couple of the really bad ones. And, you know, COVID is uh, a nasty virus. It's more severe than the flu. So please try to keep up with your uh, vaccination schedule. Absolutely. And while we're on the topic of infectious disease surveillance, the CDC recently released and revamped their COVID and infectious disease wastewater monitoring system. Can you first explain what we really use wastewater monitoring for and then why this is important? So virus is uh, shed in the waste, ends up in the sewer system, and you can, you can test it. It's very simple. And basically, you get an idea in a community if there's a lot, a little bit, or almost none, or none. Okay. So there's uh, multiple centers around the United States that are surveillance centers that the CDC monitors. And they found that the, the numbers are going up. And I am really not surprised because I'm seeing so many new COVID cases. Um, and people are doing well with the COVID. You know, people are vaccinated, and, you know, uh, uh, even the unvaccinated, whatever. Everyone is, everybody is getting it. Uh, but the hospital rates and the death rates uh, remain relatively calm. It's all relative. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's good. But there, it, I, I am just not surprised at this at all because I've seen so many uh, cases clinically myself. 
Absolutely. And that does reflect the newest wastewater data that showed the highest level of viral activity, COVID viral activity, I should be specific, in the Midwest right. uh, compared to other regions of the United States. Right. Yeah, but it's not homogeneous. It, it, it just spreads around and, uh, at different rates. But there's so much movement now. The airplanes are full. People traveled over Thanksgiving. Um, and we're going to see the result of the, the Thanksgiving travel probably by next week. Mm -hmm. And kind of keeping on the same topic, there is not a new COVID variant, one that we've heard of before, but a COVID variant that's kind of making a few steps back. It's calling its way back to dominance. Can you let us know about, you know, the current variants that make up the most cases in the U.S.? Yeah, so the the most the most common now in the United States reported is HV1, which is 31.7%. These numbers get updated all the time, by the way. And we had EG5, the 13%. And the other, the newest one is the BA286, which is increasing more in the Northeast and is even more transmissible. Now, none of them, they all seem to act about the same. So there's no difference in activity. Uh, they're highly mutated, but the new ones only, only take over because they're even more transmissible. So this thing is just getting highly, highly transmissible. It's just, that's why so many people have COVID now. Mm-hmm. And moving on to our headlines, but sticking in the COVID realm, the WHO every month or so will release an epidemiological report on COVID-19, on global numbers. Can you explain their most recent one and why the numbers may look a little bit different from what we've previously seen? Well, the reporting globally uh, has fallen off just like it has here in the United States, although we still report um, hospitalization rate and deaths pretty well. Um, we're not reporting COVID cases. And that's complicated by the fact that most of the cases are diagnosed over the counter now. Uh, and they don't, that those numbers and cases don't end up in the medical system in any way. We just, we just know that there's a lot of it, but we can only capture them um, uh, if they get sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, so like 104 case uh, countries actually report COVID cases and 43 report COVID deaths. So it's a, it's a limited data set, but it gives you a snapshot of what's going on in the world. And the the it looks like the um, the case was in the last 28 days. Now this is not everybody reporting, and you know it's relatively limited data. There's been a global decrease in the number of uh, cases uh, compared to September. So um, we'll see. Um, there's been strange numbers coming out of this, 12% of new hospitalization, 12% decrease in new hospitalizations of those reporting. However, ICU admissions have increased. Now that shouldn't be surprising because people have to be in the hospital for a while before they get into the ICU, you just don't go to the ICU. It's the ones that stay in and are the, are the sickest. So anyway, it, uh, it is what it is and you take it, take it for what it is, but you know, there's no giant spike. Let's put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. That's good. And it's not going away. That's bad. And they they track all the variants too, uh, just like we do in the United States. And they have a better worldwide picture. So while there's a lot of travel and everything, um, there's uh, the global travel is less than the, the national travel. I mean, we travel within our country way more than we travel overseas. But there's enough overseas stuff that everything is going to float around the world at one particular point. Right. And keeping on the topic of those who are most vulnerable to COVID, there was a new study that came out with some good news, some optimistic news regarding a change in the rate of preterm births caused by maternal COVID infection. Can you please break down that study for us? Yeah, it was clear from the beginning that uh, if, you got, if a pregnant woman got COVID, uh, there was a much greater risk of her uh, having a preterm birth. So having a baby before the baby is supposed to you know, be delivered. So preterm birth is associated with all sorts of complications and problems and hospitalizations for the mother and for the baby and all this other stuff. So preterm birth is not good, all right? And, uh, you know, but there are preterm uh, births. And what happened in 2020, the, the uh, preterm birth rate went from 6.9% to 12.3. So that was a 78% increase, and that was attributed, attributed to COVID. Then the vaccines got introduced, and they studied, you know, vaccines in uh, 
pregnant uh, nurses working in hospitals. And, you know, there were multiple studies uh, around the world looking at this. And the first group to have that preterm birth rate drop down to actually normal levels were the, the first women who were vaccinated. So vaccination decreased preterm births. And then when everybody in the world got COVID, plus all the vaccines are out there, the combination of those two made this preterm birth thing really kind of disappear. So, you know, the uh, the immunity now that's in the population, whether you're vaccinated or not, brought that down really to uh, reasonable levels, the, the baseline level. Um, and so that's good news. But it's, it's just interesting to see, you know, at the beginning, you know, that preterm birth rate almost doubled. The vaccinated women did better. Uh, and then ultimately, everybody did okay because there was so much immunity from either the vaccine or being infected that uh, the rate went down. So that's it, it's it's good news, but it also shows the benefit of the vaccine in pregnant women. Absolutely, and more encouragement to look for that next COVID vaccine that's out there and stay up to date on your vaccinations. Mm -hmm. But keeping on the COVID topic, one of the surrounding things we've been talking about a lot is long COVID and right. really getting into the mechanistic discoveries that are being made through current research about long COVID. There was a recent uh, study that was presented and research presented at the 2023 annual meeting of the Radiological Society of North America here in Chicago. Right. Could you please tell us about this research that was presented? Well, the RSNA meeting is a very famous meeting because it occurs right after Thanksgiving in the United States every year. And it's one of the largest, if not the largest medical meeting in the world. And it takes up a lot of space because radiology, people have all that equipment and stuff like that. So there's very few places that can handle that much equipment and that many people. And it, it's a terrific meeting. Uh, anyhow, uh, investigators uh, from Germany uh, did a study in 173 patients with and without COVID, with and without long COVID, and uh, looking at MRI imaging, and they used diffusion microstructure imaging, very specific type of brain imaging. And they found that there was a very specific pattern of microstructural changes in various brain regions, and that this pattern difference between those who had long COVID and those who didn't have long COVID, and even those who had COVID and those who never had COVID. Um, and so th this was from Freiburg, Germany, uh, the, the uh, investigators, and, uh, you know, they, uh, I mean, this is really a pretty important study because it shows that there is a pathological, they, they see the pathological finding in the brain that's associated with the symptoms that we've known all along. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a it's a great study, uh, but it doesn't answer the questions of exactly what is doing that, how it's being done, who's at risk. It also doesn't tell us what happens over time. This is a snapshot, so we need to know what happens long term in those with long COVID. But even more importantly, what happens in people who've had COVID? You know, there's a huge pile of people who've never had COVID, and so you know. Do these changes affect somebody in 10 years or 20 years? You know, we, we don't really know. Uh, but it, it, uh, it's a, uh, a, a great, uh, uh, it enhances our knowledge of what's going on and explains some of the findings in people with long COVID. Absolutely. And it gives a strong basis for future research and studies to be built off of these concepts, which is equally as important. Mm -hmm. Lastly, today, we are ending our session with a story out of northern China. The WHO has updated, you know, the world, the media on an upsurge of pediatric respiratory illness within northern China. Can you please break down that situation for us? What kind of, you know, respiratory illnesses are they talking about? How big is this issue? Well, since mid-October of this year, WHO, which has offices in basically every country in the world, including China, uh, noticed an uptick in respiratory illnesses in children. Um, and they're very keen on this in China, obviously. Um, and they studied these uh, and they found clusters of these respiratory infections, very serious uh, hospitalizable cases. And they examined them and they found all the usual suspects. In other words, they didn't find anything new, but they found all the old stuff. 
mycoplasma, streptococcus, RSV, adenovirus, uh, COVID, flu. You know, they found all the, the usual things, but they just found more of them and, and in clusters. And so it's, it's you know, they're still following that. Uh, they did report it. Um, reporting from China can be somewhat opaque, but this is, seems to be very open about it. And WHO has confirmed these cases and looked at the evidence. They don't see anything. So then lo and behold, I think just yesterday, it was a press release from Warren County, Ohio, Cincinnati, of 142 cases since mid-September of excess number of uh, uh, children with uh, resp severe respiratory illness, which they're calling white lung syndrome. Because uh, when you get a pneumonia, when you do the chest X-ray, that if there's nothing bad, that the lung is, is black. And then if there's pneumonia, it's white. So that's why they call it white lung syndrome. So the average age was eight, uh, as young as three. And they've done the same thing with um, that the Chinese did. They look for everything. You know, but we, we have the testing equipment to test for really anything. They found all the same stuff. this mycoplasma, strep, adenovirus, flu, COVID, RSV, all the usual stuff that can affect kids. Um, and nothing new, no new pathogen. There's not a new thing. It's not a new coronavirus or, you know, whatever. So um, the possibility is that um, the number one possibility, now this is not possibility, not proven, but it's just a, a theory at this particular point, is that we're seeing this in these kids because during the COVID, they're blaming it on the COVID pandemic because the COVID pandemic, remember when uh, uh, we had COVID in 2020, uh, and beginning of 21, there was almost no influenza. The COVID just outbeat everything. So we had one year with almost no influenza. Well, in kids, and everybody knows kids, and when they start going to daycare and school, they get always with respiratories and sniveling and coughing and all that stuff. So um, uh, they think that there may be, uh, this is due to an immunity gap related to the COVID pandemic because there were fewer of these lists of respiratory infections that kids always get. And now that everybody's back, you know, in school again and meeting with groups and whatever, those kids that didn't get immunized a couple of years ago are now getting sick. So it's called an immunity gap hypothesis. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's just a hypothesis, but uh, I don't know. It makes sense to me, but uh, you know, we'll see these, uh, these cases will obviously be followed very closely and there's likely to be more of them. In China, I think it started in Beijing and then the other uh, states uh, reported it and here reported in Ohio, but we'll see. Now that everybody's looking at this, all the epidemiologists are gonna be following those cases very closely and, and we'll see uh, what happens, but you're gonna be hearing more about this. Now, keep last point is that mycoplasma, streptococcus, flu and COVID and RSV, five of the big ones that cause this are all treatable and or preventable. So, you know, if you have those things, kids can be treated or you can give them a vaccine to prevent it or a monoclonal antibody is in the case of the RSV uh, vaccine. So, um, you know, keep that in mind and keep up to date your kids with their vaccination schedule. Absolutely. But if the theories are proven to be true, it would show that that immunity gap hopefully can be somewhat bridged by these treatments and vaccinations, preventative measures, anaclonal, monoclonal antibodies that are available on the market they, today. They definitely can. This is a pure, everyone knows all this already. The clinical data is always very strong. Absolutely. And on that note, Dr. Murphy, thank you very much for your time and expertise this morning, breaking down the latest headlines and research for us, as well as the U.S. COVID statistics. We appreciate your time and expertise as always. Great. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us again this week. As always, if you have any questions for Dr. Murphy, please submit them down below or click on any of our social medias in the description and reach out to us there. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.